I'm Olivia J. Hooker. I was born in Muskogee, Oklahoma, where we lived until I was three years of age. My father opened his business in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we family moved to Tulsa. And that must have been 1918, because I would have been three years old. And while Daddy had his business there, we were placed in school. I went to a little private school that was in a church basement. And so that I had had two and a half years of schooling before the Tulsa catastrophe happened. And therefore I could already read and write somewhat. I couldn't write much, but I could read. My daddy had used his typewriter to teach me to read. And so he had been a teacher in his early days of Mississippi. I had a large family, I'd call it. We had four girls and one boy, Samuel, and my mother and father, and that composed the whole family. My grandmother, whom we call Mama Sita, came to stay with us whenever she was needed. She didn't live with us. She lived with her daughter, Olivia, in McAllister, Oklahoma. My mother went away to study corsetry in Kalamazoo, Michigan. So Mama Sita stayed with us and looked after us. I went first, as I said, to Miss Hall's school. And then when you were six, you were allowed to go to public school. And I went to Dunbar School in Tulsa, Oklahoma. However, of course, when the catastrophe happened in May the 31st, 1921, the schools were destroyed. And there were no schools after that Tulsa catastrophe. There were other uh, activities for children. We went to Sunday school, and there were things that people planned, and they would, you know, invite the children of the neighborhood. But they were all in the Greenwood District. We never went downtown, and we never went out of the Greenwood section because we had everything we needed out there. As a child, I went downtown only once in my life. My sister took me with her to the bank. She did my father's banking, carrying the money to the bank. And in Oklahoma, in those days, no highwayman would rob a 12-year-old girl. And so it was safe to send the money from the store downtown to the bank with Irene. And she took me one time and I was just amazed at the Tencent store. I had never seen a Woolworth store. I was enchanted. There was no recreation, you know, that we, we were not without recreation because people planned things for the children. When school was out or there was a holiday, they'd think of something and we would get together. We lived on a hill. They call it Standpipe Hill. And that was a good place for children to play. It was safe and uh, it was a very nice environment to grow up in until, you know, the catastrophe happened. The Greenwood area had just about everything a person would need. As you can see, there were hotels, there were drug stores, there were clothing store, my dad's store, but there were other little stores that might have sold one thing, like shoes. There were grocery stores. There were beauty parlors, of course. Some of the ladies had learned Poro method of doing hair, and they had their little salons. 
there was one theater, the Dreamland Theater, which is on this picture somewhere, and there were churches, and um, one enterprising gentleman had started a recreation park because we weren't welcome at other people's parks. So he started, Mr. Barry started a park and he had a swimming pool in it and uh, other kinds of things for you to ent entertain yourself. He then started a jitney line, which was a bus that would pick you up and drop you where you wanted to go for a small fee of, I think, 10 cents. Mount Zion Church was a beautiful building that had just been finished and the, they dynamited it during the catastrophe and it's shown here the aftermath of the riot it says. My uncle Jake was a photographer and his photography shop was up this street on Archer Street which was sort of the dividing line between Greenwood and other parts of Tulsa. All of the people were very loyal. I mean, they would buy everything that they bought from some uh, enterprising African-American. And uh, I think that's partly what the trouble was about because we weren't spending any money downtown. Mm. And uh, it was decided apparently by the city fathers that they wanted to expand the town, but they didn't want to pay people to move over. They just thought, that we'll get rid of them. And my father's customers used to come and tell him, Mr. Hooker, the folks I work for are stocking all kinds of ammunition and weapons in the basement. And so we knew that they were planning something or they wouldn't be piling up weapons in their basement. So this, there was one young man who was a window washer and there was only one bathroom downtown that black people could go to. And it was on the fourth floor of this building. So it was said that he had two buckets of water in his hand, walking in to the elevator to go upstairs to the bathroom. He stumbled, and so he grabbed at the elevator operator. She screamed, and people said that he attacked her, which he hadn't, and the sheriff was called and put him in jail. So it was rumored that something was going to happen, and then the Herald Tribune, which was a Scripps Howard paper, came up with a headline Negro to be lynched tonight. When that came out, the black soldiers who had just come back from World War I, and they had guns, they said, we will not have a lynching in Tulsa. We'll go down to the courthouse and tell the sheriff, we'll protect the man. So they went down and they spoke to the sheriff at the jail. And he said, I don't need help. I can protect him myself. But they still stayed around, and then crowds began to emerge. And when the crowds of non-black people gathered, they saw one man and they said to him, what are you gonna do with that gun? And he said, if I have to use it, I will. And they killed him. He was a leading physician in the town. He had graduated from Harvard and had studied at the Mayo Clinic. He was a fine surgeon, but they shot him. Well, when they shot him, that started the trouble, the fighting. And we are not able to tell how many people of what color were killed because my father said that they put the bodies of the non what non-blacks, they put them in boxes, in pine boxes, and marked it with the N-word and dropped them in the Arkansas River. And some black people saw them doing that. So they know that there were casualties that were never acknowledged as casualties. They just disappeared in the Arkansas River. And uh, they didn't want 
the young men who had been to war to know how successful they had been in shooting. So we, there's no record of who, who disappeared at that time. However, people took all kinds of advantages. Our bank in Muskogee took my sister's education. My sister Irene had education funds in the bank and they claimed when my mother wrote for her account after we moved, they said they'd never heard of her. So I guess they did that to all of their customers who had money in their bank. They figured, well, we'll just take this over. And she never got her money from the Muskogee National Bank. And uh, at the beginning, after the trouble, they made a law that black people could not rebuild in the spot where they owned the land. However, I will say John Hope Franklin's father was a lawyer and he lived there and he was able to get that law reversed. If you owned the land and you could find some something to build with, you were allowed to rebuild. But there were all kind of mean decisions of that sort. Now, at the time, Booker Washington High School actually started in the first grade and went up to the 12th. And part of the Booker Washington High School did not burn. So that was used as a repository where my dad and Mr. Gregg, who was the brother of Bishop Gregg, he was a wise secretary. They decided to take Papa's money, which he found in his safe, he didn't have any money, but he had bonds, uh, war bonds, and so they cashed them and went on a speaking tour. And the way that black people found out about the Tulsa disaster and spoke at churches and the people sent barrels of clothing to the people in Tulsa, whom they call refugees, and those barrels were stored up in the end of Booker Washington High where people could go and see if they could find something to put on or they could find some shoes for their kids or so forth. But it was the Red Cross, actually, the local Red Cross in Tulsa had decided that they would tell people, we'll give you cots and sheets if you come to our house and do the laundry. Because, of course, they didn't have any help once they burned the folks out. So the word went out. Walter White from the NAACP came to Tulsa right away, well, you know, the day after the riot. And because Walter White was not visible to them, I mean, they didn't know what he was, he found out a lot of things. And he told the people, don't take anything from the local Red Cross. And then the National will come in and see what the trouble is. And that's what happened. The National Red Cross sent a wonderful person there, and he started, you know, doing the right thing and helping people. But the people stuck together. That is, the uh, man who was manning the machine gun that was shooting at our house sent the deputies down to tell my mother to get out of the house, that he could not protect her. Well, my mother was putting water on the house to keep her from burning, so she said to them, I will not leave, but I'll go up and talk to the machine gunner. So she went up to the machine gun captain and she said, I have to put more water on my house. I can't leave. And she plumped Naomi, who was three, down beside him. She said, you take care of my baby while I wet my house some more. So she left Naomi with the machine gun man and went back down to the house and poured more water on all the window sills. And uh, so the, he got very provoked and he sent a whole gang of his deputies down. And he said, you have to obey the militia. They want you out of this house now. And so my mother said, well, all right. So she took us and we walked to see the, uh, the mob people had taken my dad and my, my eight-year-old brother by at gunpoint, and they took them somewhere and locked them in to a holding bin. So there was just us girls and mama. 
And uh, so we went, they said, you have to go to a place of safety. And my mother said, let me remind you, I had a place of safety. And she had stood up on a big rock on Standpipe Hill and preached at the people because they had brought little children to come and watch the burning out of the black people. And my mother talked to them and said, you know, this is going to be visited on the children on to the third and fourth generation. And she pointed at the little folks. And they, they said, make that lady shut up. She's scaring our children. So one gentleman came over to my mother and he said, I can't go in your house while the mob is in there. They were in there hacking up my sister's piano and breaking the records and all. And uh, he said, when they go out of your house, I'll go down and try to put the fires out. So my mother said, thank you. And that's when she agreed to go to, quote, the place of safety. But when we got there, the, all the parents told the children, because Walter White had warned them, don't take anything from the local Red Cross. You want the national to come in. And so they would say to the children, would you like milk and cookies? And the children said, no. And the mothers had all told the children, they've taken away everything you had then they want to give you milk and cookies. Just tell them you're not hungry. And so kids wouldn't take anything. And at the end of that day, they said, well, you might as well go back. We don't know if you have a home or not, or if you, you can go back to your ruins. So we went back to our ruins. And when we got back to our house, it was still intact. My brother was hiding behind a pile of laundry mama had put out for the laundry people. And uh, so my, my dad had sent him out of that holding pen and back home. So we got all together except for Papa. He didn't get home for a couple of days. But uh, our house luckily survived. The mama had wet it down so well and the roof had been painted. So the incendiaries that they dropped from the airplanes did not ignite the roof. And the house was made of stucco, and so that doesn't burn so easily. And our house did survive. But uh, nothing remained of the store. That all the fully stocked shelves were pillaged. And, you know, they took everything, and then they, they burned up the building after. But they apparently could not get in the safe. And Papa found out that the safe was still okay and that's how he was able to get his war bonds out and a lot of people used to bring their money to papa when they were lucky and say keep this till i need it so he went around and distributed all the money back to the people who had left it with him for safekeeping and uh, people started a little uh, gatherings to teach the children until the schools got going again but my parents were so distressed having five kids and no school that they said we better move away and that's how we moved to Topeka, Kansas 